so how does, I mean, how does that process go? Like, so you, you know, you go through this traumatic event at, at Boston and then you kind of make this commitment, I assume to yourself to, to go and go on this journey. How does that logistically come together? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of it, was meeting people other places and them at races and then them telling me about other cool things in the world and like that's how I found a lot of the races but um you know I was it was towards the end of college so like the timeline of it really was um Boston 2013 was my freshman year of college so spring of my freshman year and I was running uh cross country uh collegiately at that time and then once the fall came, I just couldn't run anymore. I just didn't want to. So I stopped running collegiately and then decided I needed to go back and run Boston in 2014. Mm-hmm. So that, that spring of my sophomore year. Uh, and then had this, you know, high hopes that everything was going to fix itself. And then it didn't. So then took this hiatus from running until halfway through my junior year when I went on this mission trip to Nicaragua. And realized that I love trail running and running in kind of these beautiful places just because I loved it, not because I wanted a PB or I wanted a medal or mm-hmm. I wanted anything else. It was just because I wanted to, to learn to love running again. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it, it, you know, the first so that was, you know, January 2015 was Nicaragua and that was towards the end of my junior year of college. So it was quite complicated at that stage figuring out, all right, I, st- I have this next summer now to maybe go on a trip or go do something but then I still have another year of school left and that's kind of when traveling and these races opened up for me so I ended up going to Australia New Zealand for that first summer went back did my last year of college and um, then it was a matter of kind of figuring out where I wanted to go and like I said it was just meeting these people and hearing about these races a lot of time on Google and Mm -hmm. you know all you know all these other places but kind of how it worked in the way I did it is I was really lucky to be a paramedic where I could, you know, work pretty, you know, I was always able to get work. So it was mm-hmm. a matter of, you know, when I was in the United States, it was working 70, 80 hours a week for, you know, two months and then going to travel for four or five months. It was just making enough money until I could go do the next thing. And it was sleeping in my car between my bike and my skis or crashing on someone's couch because I was just, I wasn't here enough to, yeah. you know, get a lease for an apartment. And right. Like, I don't, I loved it. It was, you know, you know, some of the best years of my life. Yeah, it was I like I I have not personally done it. I I've, I've traveled a little bit, but I know people that have kind of lived that lifestyle and from what I can glean, there's just something freeing about not having anything. It's just like get up and go for the day. Like what are we doing today? And that's all you're focused on is you know, assuming you've got enough to live on. Right. Because you know, there are some people that got like, kind of become run bums and just like do do whatever to get by and don't don't have that back and forth like you did um but yeah i think and i think sometimes that's that's appealing to people they get i'll say to like a like a midlife stage and they think why do i have like a house and kids and a car and a dog and like what do i really want all these things let's just throw it all away and like go on an adventure so i i think it's cool that you you know, spent the time to do it and you have that, you know, kind of under your belt, not just in the sense that, yeah, you've got that notch, but in the sense that I'm a believer that travel changes people. Huge. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so it's just like, it, and I also feel like if more people traveled, we'd be able to figure out are like, we're not going to agree on things like, you know, we're still going to have things we disagree on, but I feel like, after you've been a traveler, you understand a little bit more about, hey, like I'm in somebody else's backyard. Like I need to be willing to talk to them and figure things out, not just be like, well, it's my way or the highway, you know? Right. You know, I think one of the the most interesting things was when I hiked the Appalachian Trail, it was like the ultimate equalizer for mm-hmm. humanity. And I think you say it like with, with any long trail, really, because, you know, what you go through that day, what, you know, if you're camped, you know, especially the Appalachian Trail, which has, you know, a, a fair few shelters among it, which is commonly where people camp because there's a water source there and things like that. You know, at the end of the day, you start talking to people. What you did that day, whether, you know, it was pouring rain or, you know, there's a ton of vertical gain, they did that exact same thing. And I remember pretty early on in the trail, I think it was either northern Georgia or just the start of North Carolina, 
there was, you know, like a 22 year old kid talking to this 45 year old guy mm. and about, you know, pack weight and different types of gear. And it turned out, you know, the 22 year old kid quit his job at 7-Eleven and the 45 year old guy was on hiatus as an IC physician. And it's like where other, you know, in what other circumstance in life would you see those two people interacting mm. on, on that personal level? And I think when we take away all these distractions and you know, all these status symbols, whether it's your job, the amount of money you have, things like that we start to relate to people a little bit better. And I wish that we could do that more so outside of, you know, wilderness areas and more so in, in regular life. Yeah, well, it's like that that moment where you are, you're both in an unfamiliar area, you are going through this shared experience, like you now have something together with this stranger that you wouldn't necessarily have otherwise. And that gives you some ability to connect over like what's happening it kind of brings down that barrier. Whereas like, you know, so much, especially right now, so much of our interaction happens over the internet and not even like, right. you know, we're, we're basically hanging out face to face all via screen, but just like, right. you know, you know, anonymized forums or even Facebook, which people kind of treat as relatively anonymous, even if it's not, mm-hmm. you get, I think sometimes you get the i'll say the worst of humanity being a little facetious but just because people don't have that face-to-face connection to be like oh i i can empathize with this human being sitting across from me and think hey maybe i shouldn't like say these terrible things to them maybe they actually have feelings and that you know they go through things that i do as well right i mean all these platforms kind of dehumanize it in a way yeah yeah it's like i would you know if i had the option maybe i'd say okay well we'll make you a tour guide and just be like just start sending people out on journeys and be like all right bobby's gonna take you out and like we're he's gonna take you across three continents awesome. instead of seven yeah that'd be sweet i'd love that <laughs> it's just i don't know man it's it's one of those things where sometimes i wish you know we're only people like single people individually it's like you can only touch so many lives but it's like if you could get enough people just trying to figure out how to connect on a human level instead of being like you know this is my agenda and if you don't agree with it like forget you it's like like we all have things in common whether we believe it or not yeah it's huge and i i think it was really um you know traveling what this is what brought that out of me when it was, you know, cause the, I think the worst thing that parents teach their kids, and this is, you know, a blanket statement, but like, don't talk to strangers. Like mm-hmm. I, I, that's to an extent, that's horrible advice. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think people focus too much on that sometimes and, and people aren't able to, to open up for that reason. And I, you know, I, I heard a lot of really cool statements and sayings and phrases while I was traveling, but one of the ones that stuck the most with me was, and I was sitting on a boat in Australia with this German guy and we were having a beer and we were, we were talking back and forth and we were both traveling by ourselves. And he said, you know, it's hard to be alone when you travel alone. And when you first hear that, it sounds so incredibly backwards because I think when I first went on my, my first big solo trip, it was me in my backpack and I was like, all right, I'm going to be by myself for the next few months. And that's going to be it. And, you know, it was the most social thing that ever happened because Mm -hmm. you know once you do that as humans we're we're naturally social creatures and we want to interact and we want to reach out we want to relate to people you know it's something that i think we all crave and it's just a matter of of getting outside of your comfort zone to do that and once you start and you realize that the world isn't this big scary place you're able to do it that much easier the next time um you know because like i said i had never traveled much really before i started going off on you know on that first big adventure and having not been exposed to much and being quite sheltered growing up really until I was, you know, 20 years old. Um, I didn't know much about the world. And then all of a sudden I was involved in the Boston marathon bombing. And then the mm-hmm. world was this big, scary, horrible place. Yeah. And I needed to let myself open back up to it again. And it very easily could have gone the other way. I could have just, you know, hermited myself into, mm-hmm. you know, God knows where, but you know, you know, I hate that the Boston Marathon bombing happened to me, but on another term, I, I needed it to happen to be the person that I am now. You know, it's it's interesting to see about, like, people's perspectives and in, in, in how they approach traumatic events or terrible events. Um, I was just speaking uh, last week, so it'll be a couple episodes ago from when 
this comes out. Um, a gentleman who lives in Germany, and uh, he's a dermatologist, but just about the current pandemic situation and mm-hmm. my penchant towards um, like almost eternal optimism, where I'm like, I believe in the human spirit, and like people can get through this. But then some people, like you said, go to that option where it's like, I'm just going to like bad things happen. I'm just going to stay inside, like not confront <laughs> reality right. anymore and just stay in my safe little bubble. But then you like, at least in my opinion, it seems like those people limit the possibility of what they can become and the good that they can do when they kind of shut themselves off from the world. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's a, a scary, scary thing when people shut themselves off from the world. Yeah. So, you know, as you're targeting, it kind of made me wonder, you know, obviously not literally, but just like on your journey, I think we would agree that running has therapeutic events or ther- therapeutic um, effects. There's the word. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it almost sounds like connecting with people on the journey was more of like the, the medicine that you got rather than just the runs themselves Would that. Yeah. Would you agree? That's true. Uh, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's what, you know, fed a lot into why I wanted more and why I craved more. It was like, you know, as soon as I got back from somewhere, it was counting the days until, you know, the next trip. And cause I just knew that there were, you know, I just thought it was the most amazing thing that there were so many people because a, a lot of my friends really, when you think about, you know, who your closest friends are, they're people that you grew up geographically close to or people mm-hmm. that you went to school with. And then it was like, you know, there's this whole other world out there of mm-hmm. people that you've not met yet. And like every time I go away, I'd come back with, you know, all these new amazing friends that I would go visit. And, you know, probably the best example of it really is, so I've been living in Scotland for the last seven months and okay. I just came back because of uh, the pandemic, really. My um, my girlfriend's Scottish and we were supposed to hike the Pacific Crest Trail this summer. So we were supposed to come to America at the start of April. And then it's kind of the, the travel ban started happening. We <laughs> booked earlier flights and came in the middle of March and, yeah. you know, it, you know, it was kind of like that middle of March where like every day things changed like with the greatest margins. Mm-hmm. So very quickly realized that we were, you know, going to be quarantining in New Hampshire, which is not, mm-hmm. I mean, we're in a great spot. We're still able to, you know, safely um, self-isolate and make it to the White Mountains close by without you know having much of an impact. So we're, we're, all things considered, we're really lucky because neither of us were planning on uh, having work for the next you know, five months because we're going to be walking the PCT. Um, mm-hmm. So like since the, since everything happened, I've gone back to work in New Hampshire and we were out in the hill, out in the mountains every other day. Um, so, you know, all, all things here are really lucky, but, you know, I ended up in Scotland because it was my last continent was uh, the, was Asia. So I decided to do the Everest marathon in Nepal. And, you know, that one in particular, like you get to know people really, really well because you have to be out there for, you know, four or five weeks acclimatizing. So, you know, you're interacting with the same people every single day, and, mm-hmm. you know, by, you know, two of my best friends in the whole world now were, were people that I met, you know, during that event. It was this uh, woman from Scotland, Fiona Smith, and this guy from Ireland, Tom Power, and she's a reindeer herder, and he's an Irish police detective. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's like, I, and since then, you know, they've come to America uh, two or three times. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fee and I have gone to Ireland multiple times. You know, Tom's come over to Scotland, you know, a, a ton of times after that. And, you know, it was going to visit Fiona one of these times and like helping her with the reindeer and kind of living up there that I met my girlfriend. And now it's mm-hmm. like my, my whole life has just changed so dramatically. But it's like, it's a, it's a similar thing where, you know, why would you ever expect a, a 26 year old paramedic, a 34 year old? Scottish reindeer herder and a 46 year old Irish police detective to be friends it's just like the most hilarious thing but like it just it would have never happened if I didn't you know open myself up to that yeah it's like I so I uh one of my best friends is a Brazilian import to Canada I met in Montreal and he now lives in Newfoundland it so we we talk or chat probably every other day now it's been I met him, I was 25 and 31 now, so it's been a while. Um, but it's like I never would have met him if I had not decided, hey, like on a lark, I'm going to go to Montreal and be there for a month by myself and just see what happens. But it's like there's, right. there's this and, – and 
this story happens over and over and over again for the people that just make the leap, you know, and meet these people that you make a connection and, and friendship is almost one of those like odd things where it's like, well, why are you friends with somebody? You know, like, right. you don't like, you don't share resources. You don't, are not related by blood. Like it's a voluntary association with somebody yeah. that you both have to make effort to maintain yet somehow these things happen. Yeah. And, and it's like, you meet, I, I sometimes I think it's like, you know, to be a little deterministic, like people you're supposed to meet, you meet them, but it's almost like that, that thread of, again, just being willing to take that leap is enough to connect you to somebody else to be like, there's something there that we both see and we can share. And then we can share all these other disparate parts of our lives that are interesting to each other. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's such an interesting thing when you really break it down like that. Think about it. Yeah, As, yeah. Like you said, like that group of people, you're not. So, like the Midwest is known for being pretty insular. Like a lot of people, you know, are born here, stay here, don't move anywhere. Especially the small, you know, outlying towns mm-hmm. from Kansas City. And it's like you're just like uh, my girlfriend. And I talk about this sometimes. Cause she grew up in one of these very small towns, but has you know, moved here and traveled now. And just like your whole desire is just to stay in this town of a thousand people and never leave. Just do the same thing over and over and over again. Like there's such, there's such a big world out there to see and do and people to talk to. And yeah, I, I don't know if it's a matter of just, I mean, I guess if that's what they want to do, let them do it. It's not like forcing them, but I just feel like, if they understood what they were missing, maybe it would incentivize them to leave a little more. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I wonder if it is, you know, it's one of those things where you you don't know what's out there really until you, until you experience it. And, you know, I, I wouldn't have known unless, you know, I got pushed out my front door. Yeah. So, 